Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Flipping the Barrel, a podcast where we interview leaders in the energy space to uncover and find out more about their career and life purpose. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing Beatriz Barbosa, who is a highly motivated and skilled professional with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. She has over 23 years of experience at SLB, holding various positions in IT, line and operations management, marketing and technology, and human resources. She's currently the Enterprise Digital Performance Director at SLB, where she leads a team to deliver simplified operation and functions workflows. In her personal life, Beatriz enjoys art, good food, wine, dancing, discovering the world, and she's also a powerful dual career mother of two, Alejandro and Mariana, and wife of Darian Duran, who's also at SLB as a senior account manager for Wall Construction. So, wow, Beatriz, you have so much to unpack here. We can't wait to find out more about you, your family, and your life, and just all of the success that you've had over 23 years. So thank you for saying yes to coming on Flipping the Barrel. Oh, thank you, Maciel. Thank you, Jamie. The honor is mine to be here sharing some of my experiences and stories with all the community. Oh, thank you, Patrice. You know, your story really is incredible. And I really want to take everybody back for, uh, to start at your childhood. Um, you know, you grew up on a farm in Colombia. Uh, your father was a dentist full time, but also helped on the farm, which is a lot of work, I'm sure. Um, your mother was a stay at home mom and was your father's right hand. Unfortunately, like many of us, we have these horrible things that happen at a young age. And when you were 13 years old, your father passed away. Um, I could only imagine what that was like. Uh, and this brought some challenges to your mom, um, who ended up becoming the head of the household. Can you tell us about this experience and how it shaped who you became today and then going through something at that, you know, that vulnerable time in your life? Um, you know, how did you overcome it and how has it changed who you are? Thank you, Jamie. Certainly, it's a very touchy question for myself. Uh, it was not easy, uh, but certainly I learned a lot from, from that experience. I had my brother that he was nine, so he was even younger than myself, and I was 13 when, when the event happened. No? So I think what I have learned from it is that uh, when you have determination to do something, you can achieve it, and that was my mom. Uh, certainly, she was a stay-at-home uh, lady, uh, she was looking after us. Uh, she helped my dad from time to time with his duties, especially on the farm, because he had those, you know, he had, he had uh, two jobs in a, in a certain way. No, he was a dentist mm -hmm. plus a farm. And when all this happened, uh, there was a lot of comments from, from our friends, family, like, oh, Teresa, what are you going to do? Maybe you should change the kids from school. Uh, maybe you should change of city because the farm was in a small town, but we were growing we were growing up in Cali. That is kind of a medium-sized city in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, you know, brainstorming. You know, you can imagine the family, but my mom said, no, my, uh, the education for my kids is pretty important for me. I'm going to take charge. I'm going to modify maybe the way that we were living uh, in one way or another one, keeping education at the, at the forefront of everything now. So I think that was a kind of the main part that, you know, if my mom could do it and was able to turn things around, make of their kids successful engineers. My brother is also an engineer from the same university uh, and the university is in another city. So you can imagine all the challenges that came after analyzing the school that we were grow up. We grew up in a British school. So it was also a private school in Colombia. Then we went to a private university and I'm sure that I, if I didn't have that kind of education, I would I wouldn't be here today. I, I absolutely not. So wow. So, so uh, a lot has a to do with easy. your mom's sacrifices for her kids to make sure that they were well educated. And I'm sure she had a lot of ambition for both of you to maybe one day get out of Colombia and do something great, which you have done. So going back to your career, you know, at some point when you were trying to figure out what to do with you know your profession, you thought maybe being a dentist like your father. But you ended up changing your mind and picking civil engineering because you loved math and science and you were really good. But, you know, back then, coming especially from a farm type of life, being a young girl in Colombia, going into engineering was not, let's say, something very common specifically for that country. And at that time, you know, what made you decide to choose this career path engineering, which maybe at that age, you don't know a lot of people who are engineers. How did you have that take on I'm going to be a civil engineer. And did you have any big ambitions of one day working for a big global uh, company like you are today? 
Um, as, yeah, so it was, a, in fact, it's a funny story because, again, my, my family is more farmers and some of them are agricultural engineers, but certainly there is no mechanical, civil, electrical, nothing of that is, is, is in my, you know, in, when I grew up in my surroundings. Uh, I love math and science. Uh, obviously, I, I was a little bit attached to the dentist because it was what my father did. I like biology, so maybe it's a little bit of a, that connection with him. Uh, but when it came the time to file for university uh, documentation that in Colombia is different than the U.S. and you can change things <laughs> last minute, uh, I was having a conversation with one of my cousins about, okay, should I file here or there? I consider also economy. Uh, I wanted to be an economist. And then I think when I look at the civil engineer, I found the science, I found the math, I found the outdoors, because when you think about civil engineer, you think about edifications and constructions. And that's where I projected myself because I like to build things that I can observe, no? And, and I like that aspect, okay, maybe I, I projected myself like doing something, producing something that I wasn't going to be able to see, to touch, uh, and, and look up, you know, I'll be proud of, of that, no? And it's a little bit, and, and outdoors was kind of nice. I never thought about have been in a corporation, uh, not at all. And in fact, my mom, you said, you said one thing that, okay, if my mom thought of me about me going out of Colombia, that was never in the picture. Never, never, you know, they gave us the education in the British school, in the university, but always more for the education and being a good citizen uh, in, in our country. Uh, and certainly the career took some decisions and I, I am now in Houston, but it was never, I think everything that we have been doing is for doing good. You know, like okay, this is my next step, and 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 this is what I want to do, and and we and I have been taking it from there now. No, what I think is really incredible, as you mentioned, you know, your mom never really intended for you to leave Columbia, um, but when your friend introduced you to SLB, the company that you've now been working for the last twenty three years, um, they were looking for talented engineers uh, who spoke good English, which she checked all the boxes. Um, and so you were one of, I would say, probably one of the lucky ones there to be selected and to move forward with Summer J um, and get an internship, which later on when you graduated, you got the opportunity to be a wildline field engineer and it wasn't in Colombia. So I can only imagine what your mom thought when you said you were going to Angola. Um, mom. <laughs> how did you manage first, you know, telling your mom that you're leaving? <laughs> but second, oh, you know, there's not very many women that are on the rig um, in that area or even moving to that area at a time where you probably couldn't Google and find out everything that's going on in Angola, Angola before you actually go there and work. Oh, it was, it was definitely a challenge, no? It was, it, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, certainly, in fact, when, in, even though we know geography, but we have to be honest, when they told me, okay, Beatriz, your country of assignment is Angola, I had to go to the map and <laughs> review my uh, yeah. Africa landscape and see where was it. Um, it was not easy, but she has always supported me. You know, I, I, it was good that maybe when I went to Bogota to do my university, I already had like kind of one step uh, to live alone. So then that second step was a little bit easier, but certainly I was going to an unknown area. Um, I think that determination was... You know, as I said, you know, I, I decided to study civil engineer because I like outdoors, I like the adventure, I want to go and, and see the, the world, the field, the, the, the surroundings, and, and I never doubt about taking the job. Uh, and, you know, how I managed to navigate in that country, I think being very open-minded, um, you know, I am from Colombia and they used to say, okay, Colombia is a third world country, so it's the same as Africa. Okay, I will manage myself. So I didn't have like super huge expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, and Angola was one of my richest experiences. Uh, it was fantastic. The people, the support, the health, the uh, community, because also you have a lot of people from everywhere. And there was a lot of camaraderie between the engineers, the, between the engineers, the location, because you are, you, you are like in a little bubble, no? Even though you have a lot of contact with the surroundings, mm -hmm. but you are in a staff house, everyone lives together, we go out for dinner, lunch, you know, you call it, no? Um, so you have to be very tolerant, uh, try to listen to people, uh, be very collaborative, you know, and have good communications. When I have some needs so for days off, 
breaks or when there was something that maybe didn't match what I wanted, uh, being open to, to talk about it, no? To be, and, and be honest, no? Don't, don't try to pretend that maybe you like everything, but there were good things, there were things that were more complicated and, and try, to, try to balance one thing and the other. Yeah, I really love what you mentioned about just being open minded uh, when you get these types of opportunities, um, because they are big life changing decisions. And so just being open minded and thinking, you know, I can do this. It's very similar to maybe my, you know, my country, even though it's a different language, it's another side of the world, but kind of finding the similarities. And to your point is just uh, the the team that you have there is what's going to make it. And, you know, even when we spoke the first time, you mentioned nothing but positive things about Angola. And so, you know, it shows that it doesn't matter where it is in the world, you can find good people that are going to help you and support. And especially you were in the field in, uh, you know, in Africa where there's not a lot of women. So the fact that you had a great experience is really nice to hear. Um, you know, we wanted to ask you about 10 years into your career, you had worked in Angola, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, because you did a few roles after that. You had done operations, you had done sales. And, you know, 10 years in, you're still not junior, but you're still, you know, not 15, 20 years. And you were offered to be the M MLC, uh, you know, Middle East Center Learning Manager, which is a, a very big role, in my opinion, uh, for someone with your seniority. You know, what attributes or qualities do you think made you stand out for them to say, you know, out of, it's a big company, so out of a lot of talent to say, you know, Beatriz has the the, the ability and the talent to manage an entire training center, you know, like, especially at 10 years in, what were you doing to be noticed or to be, or to show the confidence to place you there? Well, uh, so the MSC assignment, so there is a, two stories behind it. And I'm going to just summarize the first little piece because it's important to share with the other ladies that are, you know, do a careers or their husbands are also working for any organization. So the reason that I moved to Abu Dhabi was because of my husband and the company supported me on that move. In fact, when I was operations manager for Ecuador and I was offered to go and do my first your unit operations manager role. And at the, in the same week, my husband was offered to go and manage uh, his division in Middle East. And we had kind of in, within this week, we had these two offers from the two from two different companies because he was working for another company by then. And as a dual career, we decided that it was good for Darío uh, to have exposure overseas because I had I had Angola, I was working in Ecuador, so I have been moving a little bit more. He has always worked in Latin America. He's from Venezuela. He was we were working together in Ecuador. So we said, okay, right now as a couple, what do we want to do? And then we said, okay, we're gonna go for Darío's offer. And I came back to SLB and say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna take that your unit ops manager. Long story. Uh, it was not easy going to convince them, but eventually they say okay Bea, we're gonna support you and we're gonna find you a, a job and i have always been open to any job uh any job when they came with this fantastic job <laughs> of being the mlc training manager i couldn't be happier and i think that certainly middle east is not a um, an easy region but when you have the you know when you're respectful when you have an integrity when you have credibility and good communication skills i think those were some of the elements that my 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 boss has always kind of highlighted when they have been giving me new jobs. Say, Bea, I know that you are going to take the phone and call me if there is if there if you have any doubt because it's impossible for us to know absolutely everything in the world. No, mm -hmm. but we have a good network of people that can always support us. Uh, it's always good that you know that you grab the phone, call someone, get advice. Uh, and not try to solve all the issues yourself because sometimes when you're trying to do too much yourself, maybe you're not doing your best uh, for, for the whole organization. And, and again, it's, you know, I have never tried to shine myself. I have been always working in collaboration. And that's, I think that's, that's one of the elements that they say, okay, Beatriz can, and in fact, you know, she can do the MLC job. And also I'm sure that, that they consider that when they were promoting me to be your unit manager, uh, your unit operations manager. That was a job that I ended up doing after MLC. Eventually they wanted me to do Peru, Colombia and Ecuador. And I did it a couple of years after, but I think that movement to, to Middle East uh, enriched us as a family, as a couple, and, and also as an individual, no? Again, it's another country, another uh, mm -hmm. 
set of clients, customers. It, it was fantastic. It was it was very good. On this topic, I really wanted to talk about, you know, what a lot of times we feel when we get asked roles or some roles that maybe we didn't feel that should have been ours or that there was another candidate that was better. And there's multiple times throughout your career and your story that you face this uh, personally. And I feel like we all do. And especially when we're trying to grow in a company, you have to take on roles that maybe you don't have all the expertise for, but maybe you're still the right fit and they don't need somebody that's like everybody else, right? Um, what have you learned from, from this experience? Because I, I do know from previous conversations that there was a few times where you've asked yourself, like, why me for this job? There's somebody else. Um, and I know a lot of our listeners feel that too. Uh, can you tell us about what that was like and like, how, how do you overcome that? And, and what role was that for you where it was really difficult for you to understand, um, you know, why me, but you took it on anyways. Absolutely, Jamie. And again, there are several examples, but one that I think I shared with you ladies in the previous call uh, was when I was given the ORA product champion, that is uh, the new generation reservoir sampling, uh, evaluation and sampling tool. No? And in fact, nowadays it's a digital platform and it's doing fantastic things for, for our uh, customers. So when I was, so I came back from Angola, uh, from Abu Dhabi, did the, my ops manager job, and then they decided, okay, Bea, I have done operations, HR, there is this opportunity to go and work with the technology team. And they say, okay, in what? And they, they told me, no, you're gonna be working on the replacement of the MVT. Uh, or not the replacement, because again, it's not a replacement, it's another technology, it's a platform. But just imagine that you are taking care of the most appreciated baby crown jewel uh, for SLB, for Worldline, uh, I was like, guys, you know, yes, I, I know the tool. I work in Angola, I work deep water, I work land operations in Ecuador and Colombia, but we all know that the, the, the key locations for reservoir evaluation and sampling and high tech is Aberdeen or Gulf of Mexico in La Rosa. Mm -hmm. And said, so why don't you get a person from either two locations that they are fantastic, they have all the knowledge, and, you know, and not me that maybe I, I know up to a certain point. And always the response from the company has been, no, Bea, we are, you know, we want your other attributes to come into the picture and lead this project because you are going to be able to bring this collaboration. You're not going to just create a project for yourself that you're going to be proud of yourself. What we want is a, is a, is a product that is going to be proud of for the company that embraces all the different branches that Aura can go and touch and, and embrace. And you're, uh, we're sure that you're going to be able to talk to all the SMEs, you know, look at different angles, challenge yourself, bring the best of what Middle East needs, what being the best, whatever Aberdeen needs, Gulf of Mexico, land operations, because at the end of the day, the product needs to work in many different environments and not a niche uh, region that maybe you are familiar with and you want to create whatever is needed there, no? So I... I have always challenged myself, when, but I always do the question to my boss because I always want to know, okay, what they are looking from me on that role, no? Because it, it doesn't come as, as obvious, and and then obviously with that guidance um, of, of, of the of the person that offered me that job that day, so in fact, was Catherine McGregor. I remember as if, as if it was yesterday. Uh, then I took it, say, okay, Catherine, we are gonna make it happen, and then we we work with that. And then I feel confident because that, that, that's the tricky part, no? that maybe at the beginning you're not very sure, but then when you have this reinforcement, you pass the page, you embrace the role, and you jump into, into, into execution, delivery, and, and, and certainly uh, achieve the results that the company is looking after. It was a fantastic job. I did it like for two years and a half. In fact, I left the role because I was pregnant of Mariana, and really I have to deliver my second baby, but it was, uh, it was fantastic dealing with all the tech centers, around the world and also one of the things that i learned those days is to be flexible with work schedule because i was working with japan i was working with paris you know crazy hours uh to be able to have those connections but again if you put the effort uh you can get the best from everyone and now we have a, a great product that we have available for the customers thank you so much for sharing that and I think a lot of people listening to the podcast will feel like they've had this happen to them or it will happen to them at some point because it's a lot of times where we get a role where we're unsure of. And to your point, we're not confident of, can I really do this? There's other people that are better than me that are more qualified. But I think to your point is having that conversation with the person mm -hmm. who's offering you the job and saying, 
what does the company want out of me to develop, to learn from this role? Because they're obviously giving it to you because there are certain things that they want you to grow from. So it's, it's really nice to hear that. And it's, it's a good action item for anybody who has to go through this next. And another topic we want to ask you on is dual career. This is a big topic that a lot of people are always very interested in, especially now with more and more women working and being in the workplace. They have a spouse, you know, that is also working and you've been uh, married for, you know, over 20 years and he's also SLB. And so I know at times maybe it can get a little messy, specifically, like you said, he was offered a role in the Middle East. You were offered this great opportunity as, you know, geo unit manager, which doesn't come every day and you have to make a decision as a couple. So, you know, what have you learned over those 20 years with maybe two people who are very ambitious, who want a great career, who now have two children into the mix and it's a global company with so much opportunity, you know, how, what, what advice can you give to maybe those who are going through it as a dual career right now? Maybe, maybe my, my advice is uh, there is not the perfect plan because a, a lot of people ask me, okay, Bea, Darío, do you have a plan? And I say, no, really no, because I, I think it's very difficult when there are so many variables around it. Uh, so we try to be a little bit practical um, and, and, and do the best from both ends. No? And whenever the, you know, whenever the milestone comes with a new letter, a new assignment, a new family event, we have been taking decisions as it goes. And I think the most important part is that is to be happy, no? And to always try to complement the professional career together with the, your personal uh, requirements, no? Uh, I knew that, as you said, no? Uh, when I was an Ecuador Ops manager that they offered me the whole job unit, maybe it was, it was a very obvious, nice job. And I had the, these goals, okay, there are only 20 Ops managers. How you're going to say no, but for that it was very important to have that international exposure and, 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 and build his CV. And I knew that at that point I could do like a lateral move that on the positive side, I had this great experience in MLC that also helped me building up my, my backpack of skills that I have today. You know? So, and, and then I have many examples just like that. No, we, we, he gets an offer, we review, okay, does it make sense? No, how, how, how to balance? And I know that People say that it's difficult to balance, but yes, you can balance because you can take decisions and the decisions are on our side, no? The company offered the letters or the, com or the company offered the positions and then it's up to you to take it or not. I, you know, we were offered a couple of years ago, a uh, move to, to Paris and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, I said unfortunately, but not unfortunately, unfortunately yeah. potentially for the company, we didn't take it but because it was complicated for the deal. It was complicated, complicated for my husband and then, um, you know, I stayed a bit longer on the other job, but he also moved into another job. And 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 the important thing is not to regret it. No, you, you go look at it, re decide what you want to do, and does it fit? Doesn't fit? And try to work as a as a single unit. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is that I I, I and I don't like it personally, and this is a very personal opinion, is oh, who is leading that career? I. I don't know, you know, to be honest, it's, you know, I cannot say if I'm leading or that you're leading. I think it's, it has to be a little bit of a, a balance again. You know, I think everyone has wants to to be good. Everyone wants to succeed. Uh, and, and yes, you know, he has his good movements. I follow him for a couple of moments. So it was one for him, one for me, uh, maybe another one for, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a step by step. And again, I come back to my first statement. There is not the perfect plan. Don't start to over plan because if you try to over plan, maybe you're going to be frustrated. Uh, if you say that you're the leader, but then your husband or your partner gets a good offer, why not? You know, maybe it's, it's a good time to maybe do a side job. And and maybe that side job, you never know if that side job is going to help you for the future, no? Uh, the ML, I can tell you, the MLC job that I did, because it was Middle East and also because training is related to HR. Um, uh, it was one of the skills and one of the things that when I did later, I did HR director for one of the product lines of the company, it's number the land rigs. It was because of that job that they said, okay, Bea, you know a little bit of the HR. Now we want you to do this one because we know that you can handle people, you can communicate at the personal level and dealing with so many students at the training center was, wow. was certainly not easy. And you manage crazy cases, no? You can imagine that influx that was in 2009 and it was, tons of people that we were hiring and you get all that type of stories that you can imagine from different nationalities, you know, that, that you have to handle from an HR point of view, no? 
uh, with, with, with this uh, community. So don't over plan it. Uh, take it step by step. Have this conversation with your partner and and try to balance. Yes, try, try to balance. It's, it's, it's in our capacity, no? You're the one that takes the decision, no? I like that you mentioned about not actually just not like stating who would be a lead career because I think to your point, it could it could change and it should change um, depending on who gets the best opportunity in the time period and who has the most flexibility in that time period. So I think not pigeonholing yourself into something is really important. I'm really glad that you pointed that out because there was different instances where you followed him and then he followed you. And then maybe at sometimes it's the same thing um, as far as both opportunities are just as equal. So on that topic, I think it'd be great to kind of go into flexibility, work flexibility, and why it's so important for women in the workforce. I know you talked about, um, you know, being a part of HR too, and what you did at the training center and all the different culture and all the different diversities and so many different needs for different people. Um, and the industry is hiring a lot of women um, in STEM straight out of the university. Um, and they think that they're meeting the expectations, but they don't stay. So what we're really wanting to know from your experience is, you know, how can we keep women in the energy industry, in, you know, the companies, but also, you know, how important is flexibility from your view now seeing the new way of working? Oh, absolutely. So I, I think flexibility for the new generation, and I see my cousins and, and, and younger friends, um, it's very important for them. It's super important. Uh, and I, and again, I think we have to, it's just about the balance, no? You need That's to be flexible. Awesome. And I have a lot of people that works remotely, uh, especially in my current job. In my current job, I have uh, organizations, some of them are working two or three days from home because we have a little bit of different schedules. We connect to India, we connect to uh, Kuala Lumpur. And, and, and again, giving that those space that maybe two or three days in the week, you can organize your schedule differently, depending on the demand and also your personal needs is, is very important. But I want to emphasize that it's also good that uh, and I keep telling guys, what, you know, right now, the, 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 the IT uh, requirement is that you have to go two to three days to the office. No? SLB policy is three days in the office, IT organization, because of the, the way that we operate is two. Um, but those two days are so important to be able to connect, to get 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 this feeling of trust, no? of, of having a, a side conversation, uh, innovation, because when you re work remotely, everything is very, is, 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 is very premeditated, premeditated no? you know, you, you go into the meeting, you have the topic, ta, 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 uh, you cover, yes, you are very efficient, you deliver, no? but then that side, door you know that corridor conversation that maybe 4 p.m that you finish meetings that you're in your office another person comes in and say Bea, what do you think about this topic uh or even the coffee no talking about the family and, and connecting that that's a recommendation that maybe i give to some of the young people like try to make that connection no try to make that, that connection because that's how you build trust and to be able to build trust that is it, especially if you want to if you want to follow a leadership career, and I will say that that's the difference. If you want to be uh, a technical SME uh, in the IT world, a developer forever, okay, maybe you can work always remotely, you know, eight hours a day, ta 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 ta. And, but if you want to grow in the career ladder, if you want to, if you want to be a manager, if you want to be a director, a vice president, you need to have this connection with people. You need to see them. So you need to find those elements and 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 have this conversation with your boss, with your organization, how how often they can see each other. I, I know other other companies are working very, mo very much remotely, but they meet at least once a month uh, for one week and, and try to prioritize. It's not that they're being demanding, they just want to know you. They want to know you, you know, at the end of the day, the world is made out of people and you want to see those skills of the people, especially to find the new uh, leaderships that are gonna help you live in that, company that you're working on so, so yeah I don't see this. definitely great advice and to your point I think for the younger generation flexibility is key uh, is very important for them and I think a lot of companies have adapted since you know the pandemic of at least a few days in the office a few days at home but to your point going to the yeah. office building those connections meeting in person and building trust is really what's going to kickstart off your career and help you develop. Uh, and so it is important to kind of keep that connection. And I think for women, 
um, it's it's important as well because they get the flexibility to, and, and I see a lot of companies do this where they can go drop off their kids or go pick them up at a certain time as long as you finish your work. You know, it's the flexibility of if you do your job and you need to pick up your kid, like no one's going to be looking at the clock. And I think that helps mothers to at least be able to balance it all uh, with just having a little bit of that flexibility, which a lot of companies are doing. So it's really great to see. Um, and the last question that we had, it's kind of like a two part is we wanted to understand a little bit more about your role as, uh, you know, EDP, especially now uh, in the digital world. And, you know, from your opinion and just with the different transitions with different companies, especially in the energy world to go to a digital world, you know, what steps do you think are required to prepare the workforce for this transition? And then also the second part question is. If you look at your career, I think you have such a vast difference from operations to HR to digital to, you know, wireline to product champion. It's not common to have this, you know, such a big career. You know, can you tell us a little bit about like how you've handled to jump from place to place? Because that is very hard. You know, most people maybe stay in operations their entire time or sales their entire time. You have a lot uh which is really good because you've got value all over the place, but it could be challenging, I assume, at some point. No, absolutely, Marcia, because sometimes when I look back and say, oh my goodness, it's a, a little bit of a maze, but I think that after 23 years, uh, I can I can, I can st I start seeing how all the building blocks are, are put together. Uh, but it's always, a, a, you know, I'm always a little bit afraid. And I think it's good to be a little bit afraid because that gives you a little bit of a consciousness that you have to do a little bit of extra effort when you jump into any new job, no? Not trying to overdo or overlearn, but you have to be more humble. And I think every new job, I take it like when you were a, a, a field engineer trainee, that you go and, and certainly for, for at the beginning, you have to listen, try to take notes, uh, obviously up to a certain point, but you, you, that, that listening capability that I know that is always a challenge for many of us that we want to jump into action is, is needed because uh, we are new in that environment. No, they brought us because we have some skills that you cannot just go and jump into it and, and revolutionize everything without having the you know without evaluating what what has been done good, what can be improved. Because again, everyone do their job on the best way that they are trying to do. No, so my my first my first contact in fact with a uh, digital was when I was moved from the SLR HR manager. I moved to manage the uh, digital drilling operations uh, tests that we were doing with uh, with drill ops and drill plan that it was even I think was even more crazier than the in a in a certain point than the current job that I'm doing because I, I'm world and background then I was going to drilling to you know well construction uh, to handle digital operations rig equipment and and again I have this conversation with my boss why da 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 collaboration listen. That project was fantastic. I learned so much about digital in the technology or more, yes, more on the technology space of, 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 of our oil and gas uh, uh, territory. And after being able to manage uh, three wells that we did, field tests, contracts, some field tests, I, I, I believe that, especially for digital, not, not everyone, you know, Everyone, as a, as a, I think the whole world is learning. It, the whole world is learning, and there are so many avenues to to get to learn from digital these days. Uh, and it's something that you have to embrace as a as an employee. And in fact, in, in whatever function or whatever thing that you are doing, uh, you need to understand what is your digital footprint because it's a big enabler to all the processes that we are dealing with. In whatever space you refer to, no. Again, you go to HR. A lot of the digital, uh, or a lot of the processes right now are being enabled, enabled, enabled by digital products that can make that process more efficient. That the person can focus on really when you can add value and 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 bring out out something out of it, no. So I did that one that was kind of technology digital. I went back to operations, and then when I came back to the OS and IT. Uh, division is where now today I'm managing the the portfolio of the different value streams. You know, when I, I talk value streams that we organize it's slightly different, but we cover all the processes of the company, and we look at the process, we look at the data, and on top of that process data and organization, 
is where we put like the portfolio of the digital things that needs to be on top of it. And we need to make sure that those digital items are really bringing value to that process. No? So, so, and, and so is, is, so digit, you, you, you always need to understand why you are do, doing that digital piece, because if you just launch a, especially for corporations, if you are just launching an app for the sake of launching an app, it's not going to be, it's not going to stick. It's not going to deliver the value. Maybe it's gonna it's not gonna be sustainable. Maybe it was one person that liked it, but then they drop it and mm -hmm. and that's it. Uh, that it was maybe the old way of, of developing digital products at the beginning, I don't know, 20 years ago when the digital era really started. But I think as as all companies are learning that we have to be structured, we have to uh, have a proper plan, and we need to take it a, a step by a step by step, no? Mm -hmm. How I have been learning, uh, working very close with the, with the technology team again, listening to them, going in all the ladders, you know, talking to the developers, talking to the scrum masters, uh, talking to the product owners, uh, uh, and taking a lot of notes and, and trying to build a team. Because again, they have all the IT expertise. I, ha I bring maybe the operations expertise with the business mind and, and try to, to make the best out of these uh, two spaces. And, and my recommendation from this question is uh, embrace digital. Digital is here to stay and to grow. And as, a, as an employee, as a person, uh, it's better that we know what digital can do for us and we drive instead of digital driving us. That, oh, now I have to go and see this system because it was, it was, uh, it was mandatory for my job. No, guys, you know, I think that the way that you have to see is, okay, what this system can bring for me uh try you know really learn it but maybe you always can send feedback and recommendations and, and modify in such a way that it can you know digital is for making your life better now it's or to make your job better to take advantage of it is 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 it has to be us driving digital and not digital driving us no so but but it requires time it requires time it requires patience and again being open-minded that uh, you know, to, to move from, from one place to, to another one and, and learn. Matrice, I love that you broke it all down and like where it, what you're doing today and how it applies. But what I think is the most incredible part about your whole story is really, you know, you were a young girl who grew up in Colombia in a kind of a farming community. You know, your dad was a dentist, but it still was on a farm. And, and to see that now you're running part of an organization that's doing digital. I mean, you're running digital. You're running something that is that's new, new age, new world. It's really inspiring. And I think a lot of people that listen to your podcast are going to see that you you didn't grow up in like a digital age and you weren't like you know doing coding at age eight or something you know you you were in colombia you were it was it was just a very different world for you and for you to get where you are today is is incredible and i think that you know you coming on the podcast and sharing that story hopefully you know inspires others to know that it really doesn't matter where you come from where you're born and there's so much opportunity out there and it's really up to you and your mindset to to get yourself to that that spot and you you are a, um an example of that so thank you so much for sharing and, and coming on the podcast today well thank you jamie just thank you Marcel. always a pleasure uh to, you know again we we learn so much during our careers and if we can empower uh more ladies or more men and especially to embrace new unknowns in the industry uh it's always uh you know it's always nice to dedicate this time no to, to, you know this is like a massive mentorship yeah. uh, session if you can call it some, some, some way no so thank you so much for inviting me thank you and if you like this podcast please like subscribe leave us a comment follow us we're on apple podcast spotify filmthebarrel.com we'd love to hear from you and thank you and we'll see you on the next one